But now, let us recapitulate what we did the last time. Last time we said that instead of just blindly using linear regression or polynomial regression, if you can look at the data and you can recognize a familiar friend, you can recognize a function usually some transcendental function or even a normal function, but then fitting a hypothesis to the data becomes as simple as fitting the parameters of that function or that distribution to your data. And that can have remarkable uh, uh, predictive power when you can do that. The second thing I mentioned is it is a good idea to make yourself familiar with transcendental functions and in general, no function so that you can spot your friends when you see data. It's a very powerful technique and rather underappreciated in machine learning at this moment, community at this moment. So we did that. Are you sharing time. your screen? Is this not coming through the shared screen? Oh, it disappeared. No. Okay. Once again, very interesting. Okay. Is it uh, sharing now? Uh, yes. Chapter so two. Good. All right. So, so the idea is that can we have a family of function that we know and that occur quite often in data in nature? And so we can recognize sometimes. So we go back and revisit data set two and we notice that it seems to have a sinusoidal structure. So instead of doing naive linear regression, which uh, doesn't give as good a model, but it works sort of. You have a residual, residual still exhibit patterns. You could instead, or you could do polynomial regression, which is sort of works, but you could, you could just directly hypothesize that it is some uh, A sine times Kx. Right? And when you hypothesize, it's, it, it just takes a couple of lines of code. You just tell the, tell the program, uh, what is the data is a and y, x and y, of course. <clears throat> the moment you write a formula, if the if r cannot map, the tool cannot map a parameter to the data, a variable to the data, it assumes that it is a parameter of the model that it has to learn. It is as simple as that. And then all you do is model the nonlinear least square will model. You give some initial guesses and it will start from there and it will model. When you do that, the results are quite remarkable actually. You see the residual separately um, random. There, there is no pattern in the residuals. There's no autocorrelation. There are no outliers and the QQ plot looks healthy. So you hit the nail on the head in the very first time. And when you uh, plot the curve over the data, you can, you can pretty much uh, feel that you might have, uh, you, you, your hypothesis is a very close approximation to the ground truth, whatever it is. I repeat the same thing in Python. When we do it in Python, the, everything remains the same. The only difference is it's a little bit more verbose, uh, but not by much, it, just three, four lines. Maybe it becomes now five lines, uh, but still the same. Python doesn't give you much about confidence intervals, etc. So you have to do it on your own, a little bit of coding on your own. And the rest of that is just uh, a residual plots you have to make on your own and plot it out. So this is the code. As you can see, obviously, in this code, uh, Python ten, tends to be more verbose. And, uh, but, uh, and, and so the whole question is R or Python. Generally, if you can find the solution in R, it will be uh, more brief. You can achieve a lot in fewer lines of code. It has a very robust library. On the other hand, Python is a general purpose language. Everybody knows it. And so quite often you have libraries, uh, equivalent libraries in Python. They are maturing quite fast. And uh, occasionally they are better than R. In the deep learning space, uh, there is a Python first mentality. Most of these things like PyTorch or uh, TensorFlow, etc., uh, they come out uh, Python first which doesn't mean that they don't do R. Actually, uh, you can do R torch, and you can do, uh, obviously, TensorFlow in R and so forth. So those supports come, but they come a, li a little bit later. And, but the, both of these communities are very robust. Uh, it is uh, worthwhile knowing about both. Now, one good thing is that there's a very high degree of interoperability between R and Python. Uh, for example, you can call Python code from R using reticulate, and then you can likewise call um, 
R code from Python, right? R libraries from Python. So you can actually do in uh, a lot of interoperability between the two. The second uh, data set we took was the data set two, which to us looked like the bell curve. So modeling it with linear regression was hopeless. Polynomial regression led to the range phenomenon, right? the, the wagging tails, you know, the oscillations in the periphery. And then we recall that this function looks suspicious, this data looks suspiciously like a, a bell curve, right? Now it could be a bell curve, it could be other distributions like t, a t a student distribution and so on and so forth. But let's take bell curve, it's the most common one. And let's see if we can fit a bell curve to this data. Right. When you try to fit, by the way, this is a, something I will talk about later. There's a whole family of curves which have uh, tunable knobs that can be made to look through uh, a lot of these sort of rising up and coming down or exponential decay and so forth. That's called the exponential family of functions. In machine learning, they are very, very dominant. So we, uh, we will, uh, I'll, I'll give a one day session just on the exponential family and how to use it for data analysis. And you'll be surprised at how much power you can derive just from knowing one family of functions. But anyway, uh, this is actually bell curve belongs to the exponential family. Um, and you can, it has a rather scary formula if you're not used to it. But once you get used to it, uh, it is nothing. For example, at the top, the the exponential, you realize that it is just z values, the z value squared. So it's e to the minus z square over 2. So it takes a little while to get familiar with it. But once you become familiar with it, it's very straightforward. So how do you plot it? No difference in code. Three lines of code achieves the same thing. Once again, the correlation between prediction and reality is very good. And you remember that we were getting an R squared of practically zero, right? 0, 0.007. But when you do this approach, you notice that something very nice happens. The residuals are clean, the outliers are missing, autocorrelation is absent, QQ plots are pretty healthy. And when you plot the curve, your prediction over the data, you really get a sense that you may have hit the, uh, the, the nail on the head. Right? So you can see that this is the cleanest possible curve. It is even better than the a polynomial curve that you got, like polynomial curve has these oscillations. It has excessive complexity in the periphery. Whereas this curve, the bell curve curve is very neat. It is a much simpler model and so, uh, and with uh, equal, equal, in fact, better predictive power, slightly better predictive power. And so Occam's razor principle says that the simplest effective model is the correct, is the definition of the correct one, if there is a definition for correct. So we go with this model, right? And that is the power of using, uh, knowing transcendentals, knowing functions and using them, recognizing them, right? So the same thing in uh, Python, again, just a few lines of code, nothing uh, different. The code is exactly the same as the code before, except that the formula has changed. You just define the bell curve. Oops, sorry. Um, let me zoom out a little bit. What just, yeah, you can just define the bell curve. You notice that the bell curve definition. By the way, when I pasted this code, the indentation of uh, a Python has gotten all wrong. Huh? So this code, if you literally copy paste, it will probably not work. You'll have to fix the indentation. Uh, Python is indentation sensitive. Right? Uh, I'm going to fix it in the notes in some time. So this is it. Um, we do. Likewise, the last one, uh, you look at this curve and you wonder what it is. Uh, generally, you wouldn't have a clue what it is, but if you know your transcendentals, you might suspect that it could be, it could be, for example, the gamma distribution. And the question then is, can we fit it? Can we fit and try that? Right? By the way, uh, in the beginning, when you are becoming familiar with transcendentals, and for quite some time, uh, you will have two, three functions or two, three distributions with different parameters that may occur to your mind. For example, you could have thought of the beta function. You could have thought of the gamma function. It might sort of resemble the log normal distribution and so forth. So what you have to do is just try each one of them and see which of them gives you the best model. And it becomes very easy because at the end of it, all you have to do is change the definition of your function, that's all. Right? Because the curve fit takes the uh, function definition. You just have to write two, three function definitions and feed it into the model and you can then do it. And so if you do that, uh, like uh, here, 
that you do that. And then you realize that the gamma distribution, let's see how good the parameter uh, thing is and the correlations are. You realize that this one is just absolutely astonishing. The correlation between data and the uh, y and y hat is 100% is one. And that is shocking. It's uh, the most amazing. It so happens that in this data, actually, I forgot to, as I mentioned, I forgot to introduce any noise. So this is not realistic data um, uh, that you would find in nature. Actually, gamma functions are all over the all over the place in data sets. Uh, and, but, and if you can recognize that, that's marvelous. In this data set, actually, I should remember to add some noise so that you don't get perfect correlations. But here it is, sometimes. So you get perfect correlation. And when you plot the model over data, you can see that, that you have absolutely gotten it. If you try beta function or you try log normal, you will get actually some reasonably good fit, but not as perfect of it. Right? And there are other distributions, for example, the Weibull and Gompertz. Uh, Weibull, for example, has been the workhorse of reliability engineering. So when you take a flight from here to India, most of the time, you are worried about whether you got a window seat or not, where did you get a middle seat or did you get a aisle seat and things like that, and how tiring the journey would be. Most generally, the, the fact that you might become food for sharks is not something you're thinking about. You trust the machine to take you across, the aeroplane to take you across. Yet an aeroplane is a very complex machine, and it follows very complicated aerodynamic uh, aerodynamics. Just to believe, if you just think, sit back and think, uh, this uh, 20 ton uh, machine can actually lift off uh, this hulk of uh, aluminum and uh, metal and this and luggage and people, to 300 people. This whole massive thing can actually lift off into the air, go across the continents and reach the other end. And it can keep doing it day after day after day for years. A typical life of an airplane is, what, 30, 40 years. It can keep doing it. And most of the time, nothing happens. In fact, the reliability of these airplanes is uh, extremely high. When people say that airplanes are the safest means of uh, transport, it truly is so. Uh, but if you, uh, which, whichever way you look at it, it's far safer than driving. But if you ask yourself, why is it so safe? After all, uh, aeroplane is a very complex piece of machinery. And the answer to that is, the reli there is reliability engineering. You can take a complex piece of machinery and still get a very high degree of reliability from it. You know when things are likely to fail. You can see the failure rates. You have modeled everything, and you do preventative maintenance, inspection and preventative maintenance. So it is the maintenance that keeps these machines very reliable. But what is the theory behind it? When do I know it's time to replace a thing? Right? And for that, uh, it turns out that reliability engineering utilizes the Weibull function, this Weibull distribution, quite a lot. And most of you, obviously, it's a new term, but those, uh, if any one of you have background in reliability engineering, you would remember that your textbooks are filled with the Weibull distribution. So some, you know, these distributions are tremendously powerful things. The Weibull, the Gompertz, and all of these are very, very powerful distributions. And you can build the so-called accelerated failure time models and so forth. And uh, therefore, you have a whole reliability engineering uh, and so forth based on that. So that's the power of transcendentals. Uh, you should, uh, you should uh, actually become familiar with those. Right? Uh, as a poor joke, I used to say that instead of doing transcendental meditation, meditate on transcendental functions instead. So now, uh, as a change of pace, let's come to the new topic, uh, which is multilinear regression. Regression when there are many, many features involved, not just one, one feature. Before I do that, I would like to know, are there any questions? Any questions on the previous stuff? One thing, guys, do the labs. Huh? Unless you do the labs, you won't become good at it. Uh, this nonlinear thing is in particular. So, it's not... Asif, uh, is that the code, like, I think, which changed? Uh, I think for one of them, the syntax changed. So is that working or, like, still we need to make it work? Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the library syntax yeah, changed. Yeah. No, I, I haven't gotten time. 
Um, make it work. Maybe today I'll do that and I'll update the notes. Okay. These notes, okay. need, you can see these notes are in the old format and, I, and the book that we are writing is in the new format. So obviously I have to redo it. And uh, I'm adding more examples. Uh, like for example, after doing the multilinear regression, doing the examples that are there in ISLR, I felt, uh, which is what is there in these notes that I have, I felt a bit dissatisfied and I have added two, three more examples. One of them is the California data set. Uh, another is uh, air pollution and some things. A couple of more data sets I've added. Likewise, for classifier, I've added the breast cancer and um, I'm also looking at, obviously, a bit of a stretch or aspirational at this stage. But if those of you who are interested, I'm adding the example for COVID, COVID detection and so forth. Yeah, that so, would be nice, yeah. So the notes are expanding. And uh, by the way, if anyone, one uh, thing I, I may want to request to help future students, obviously this is a, this is a, I'm asking it with an ulterior motive, but uh, you, will, you will benefit if some of you want to contribute to this book, help uh, add material to it, add some, and you can do that by adding good references, or you can say, these are the terms we encounter in, uh, that I don't understand, and I wish somebody had given me the definition or explanation of these terms. You can send me a list of those terms, and I'll remember to add it to the glossary or you guys find any good references, you know, videos, websites, books, let me know so that I'll add it to the bibliography section. At the end of the day, you know, whenever you learn a subject, if I may say so, the thing that is most important in some sense is this last section of the book, which is about, you know, tips, the tips that you have, uh, the cheat sheets, you know, the quick reference things, the, the pointers to good documentation. Otherwise, you just spend a lot of time searching through the web, the glossary, and the bibliography. The bibliography means a lot, actually. So I'm creating the bibliography. At this moment, it's not very long. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven pages long. Typically, uh, by the time we are done, and if you all contribute to the bibliography, you don't have to write it in this format. Just give me the link or point me, give me a pointer. I will add those references and, I'll, uh, and I will also add a, a chapter explaining why those references are good. Right. So this so I said uh, maybe we can also add like for each section or each chapter, we can add like question and answers, like maybe 10 or 20 questions relevant to that topic or that chapter. Absolutely, guys. If you can uh, contribute quizzes or uh, yeah. questions, I would yeah. really appreciate if you uh, please do so. I know that that Prachi will be helpful. Like, yeah, that will help us like understand that topic like much better. Right. And some like the to do projects, nice. like someone like if they want to challenge themselves, like they can do like additional project definitely uh, like in that chapter yeah actually i really appreciate anil if you can come up with something and all of you if you can come up with something help yeah. me do that there's an old african saying that it takes a village to raise a child writing a book is like that a textbook is like that it's a gigantic effort this book by the time it's done will be close to 12 1200 pages right it's already crossed five six hundred pages and i'm still feeling that it is only half done and uh, in a big effort like this, it takes the help of a lot of people to raise this baby, to bring it up. Right? So help me around in whichever way you can. Tell me, give me suggestions, read fine typos as you find, and just let me know that you found this or that. And uh, that makes a difference. Or if you feel that there is a section that could be best avoided, it's not, it's a distraction, it's tangential, let me know. And then we'll work with that, guys. That will really help you. All right. So I really appreciate that. That means it would mean a lot. I do know that uh, Prachi and Dennis, you guys were creating a quiz. What happened? Uh, are you guys still creating it? Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you probably tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. All the questions, yeah. Yeah, because uh, yeah, t tomorrow or so, or maybe day after, let's actually release the quiz on regression and classification. It would be fun to do that. All right. So, uh, and then I'll also add quite a few questions, try to find time to add a few questions to that. All right. Coming back now to our um, subject matter. Um, let us start. Oh, goodness. No, this is not. I wish I'd written this book, but I have not. Um, this one. 
multivariate linear regression. By the way, the other book was Kevin's um, famous book on machine learning. Excellent book, but a little bit advanced at this stage. Uh, multivariate linear regression. What happens when your uh, response depends on many factors, many features, or many predictors? There's a word people use. These are synonyms, features, predictors, inputs. It's somewhat synonyms, though. Uh, mostly synonyms. I mean, people make fine distinctions between feature extraction from inputs and so forth, but we'll use the word rather loosely, these words, say input, predictors, features, uh, these are all more or less synonymous. Eh? So, um, so we will take this data set, um, and this one I've left an R. I invite you to just because you, I have so far given you examples in both R and Python, I invite you to create a Python notebook uh, around it and see if you can do that. Uh, from the, for example, it, it is the auto data set. Let me give you the background. Somebody in the long time ago created data for cars, their horsepower, their weight, how much acceleration they have. Acceleration is interesting in the US and in, by convention, acceleration is the converse of what physicists would call acceleration. It is like how many seconds it takes you to reach 60 miles an hour, zero to 60. So the bigger the number, the more underpowered it is, not powerful it is. Right. So, for example, if you look at acceleration of a car, something that has an acceleration of 12 seconds is not as uh, sort of a sporty as something which is uh, relatively low, let's say 8.5 seconds. Well, of course, in today's uh, modern world, these days, what is it? Uh, you go from zero to 60 in a typical uh, sports car in what, four seconds? Is that uh, what it is? I don't, I'm not very much into sports cars, if one of you are. Actually, I probably should say I am, I have one, but I don't drive it like a sports car. But anybody knows what these days sports cars do? These, uh, and the Teslas do? Zero to 60 in what? Four seconds, three seconds? Four Something seconds. Like that. Four seconds, right? So, uh, yeah. So obviously the world has changed. This data is old. Number of cylinders is uh, typically two cylinder, three, four cylinder. Typically they tend to go in even numbers. A six cylinder and eight cylinder is of course, uh, pretty mighty. You don't find V8s easily. The uh, v V6s are very common. V8s are relatively rare. I have it in my big truck, the Infinity. Then, uh, but it's a, a gas guzzler, right? This, uh, I guess, Sorry, barely fifteen miles a Tesla, gallon. Tesla model is is two point three seconds. It's two thousand twenty model. Wow, and it is that. What did they call it? The ludicrous mode, isn't it? Ludicrous, yeah, ludicrous model. Wow. <laughs> that's a, that's, that's a, one of the best names ever. ever. Guys, a lot of echo. Uh, say that again. I was it is. Please say that again. I didn't get it. Uh, 2.3 seconds is as, fa it's as fast as a Formula One McLaren. Wow. That's, a, that's amazing. Likewise for horsepower, when this data was gathered, you see 130, 165, 200, and so forth. But today, uh, when you, okay, we can look at this. Cylinders, minimum number of cylinders seems to be three. Maximum is eight. Or look at mileage, nine and 46. Right? And the year is 1970 to 1982. Uh, 70 is the 1970, 82. So in those days, the max mileage you could get is about 47, which is uh, really admirable. Minimum is seven. Horsepower is 46 to 230. 230 these days would probably be considered a fairly average car or not, not a muscle car anymore. Uh, these days, for example, the muscle cars have 600, 700 horsepower. And uh, uh, acceleration is from... Eight, eight is the best they could do in those days. 24 was, I suppose, the fuel efficient cars. A weight, look at the weight uh, from 1613, which is a fairly lightweight car, to uh, 5140 pounds. So obviously, the, this is a, a massive, but not massive enough. These days, uh, the big SUVs are almost 6,000. Right? The weight seems to have crept up. 
Now, you look at the origin. When you do a summary of the data, you look at the origin and you realize that it has only three values. What do you conclude from that? These numbers one, two, three are probably codes for countries or regions, you know, Asia, Europe, Asia Pacific, Europe, and US regions. And if you look at the documentation associated with this data set, you'll realize that that is actually true. And so you should, uh, uh, you should study. So this is our, our data exploration space. In these notes, I've kept it brief, but I invite you to do as in-depth data exploration as you have, as I have taught you to do in the tabular data chapter, right? in the early parts of this chapter. For example, uh, data analysis chapter. You remember the the wrangling with data and so forth. So do an analysis like this, a full in-depth analysis. Uh, I leave that as a homework for you. But since we are focusing on a multilinear regression at this moment, I won't uh, dwell on that too much. Right? Uh, now you notice that the name is there, name Saleh. Do you think name is of any relevance to uh, to the uh, prediction of a of the mileage of a car? So here the target variable is the mileage. We are trying to predict, given the attributes or the features, what is the mileage of the car? Right? And assume that you don't know, you have just come as an alien, you don't really know what's the relationship between um, displacement, horsepower, acceler acceleration weight to mileage at this particular moment. Right? So um, you look at names and you ask yourself that, uh, can names matter? Like, uh, can the mileage of a car be improved just by changing its name? Probably not. It's an irrelevant feature. And that's uh, one thing. We should remove it from the. So this is what you see me do here. Do you see that select in the data set? I take, I take a subset of the data. I remove name completely because name is irrelevant. So we end up with this data. After that, you make a, a pairwise plot. Once again, I've kept the exploratory data analysis to a minimum because I have taught you much better ways of doing it. As you can see, a pairs is a pretty, uh, I mean, basic way of doing it here. I've taught you even better ways in the first uh, in the first few lectures. Use those, huh? but in the interest of speed, I've just put it here. Likewise, here's your correlation matrix. When you look at the correlation, let's study this. When you look at the correlation table, you observe that there are some things which have very strong correlation. For example, miles per gallon has a negative correlation with horsepower, cylinders, weight, and displacement. So let us think about it. Do, do high horsepower cars have lower mileage? Does that make sense? And why would it make sense? Could somebody argue for it? Could you argue for it? Why would cars with more horsepower have lower mileage? It burns more fuel. Burns more fuel. Uh, yeah, for unit time, you need to burn more fuel because you need to produce more power, more energy. If you, the only way you get it, the thermodynamics of it is that you need to burn more fuel to generate more heat, more energy. And therefore, you're burning fuel much faster, so your mileage will be lower. Now, why should mileage have to do with cylinders? More cylinders burn more fuel. Exactly. It's like each cylinder is like a mini engine of its own. So you're essentially having more engines Right, with its own piston, its own chamber, with its own piston and, uh, you know, camshaft and all of that. I, I mean, obviously, it's attached to the same camshaft, but okay. Yeah. Uh, then weight. Why is uh, mileage related to weight? More energy to drag heavy cars, so they consume more fuel. Yeah. You, you have to achieve quite a bit to achieve the same velocity, the same speed, let's say 60 miles an hour. Uh, it is kinetic energy is mv squared. So mass is there. So the more the mass, the more the energy it takes to take it to 60 miles an hour or whatever speed you want. And therefore, you have to spend more fuel. And therefore, your miles per gallon will go down. And uh, now, why should it depend on displacement? What is displacement a measure of? Anyone? Cylinder, uh, to compress the fuel, the amount of uh, displacement that the energy needs to do, right? Like the engine needs to do. So if the displacement is exactly. large, yeah, then it, it is exactly what you said. Energy to compress. 
certainly or another way to say it is that it's the internal ignition cham chamber right or the cylinders uh, total ignition ch chamber size so usually big displacements are signs of big engines so not only the number of cylinders but how big the cylinder is and so how much fuel you'll inject you know you you atomize or you mystify or whatever through the nozzle you spray into the chamber no, you have a big you have a big cylinder you'll have a big and therefore a big displacement you will have to inject a lot more fuel and you can create a lot more ignition power so the total amount of fuel you burn is proportional to the cylinders and the displacement of each cylinder and so you can imagine that given that horsepower should be very much related to both cylinder and displacement isn't it guys Then you notice that the correlation between miles per gallon and other predictors are a bit low, but there's still some correlation. We also notice that there's quite a few strong uh, pairwise correlations. For example, cylinder and displacements are uh, correlated. Why are they correlated, guys? Could you give an explanation? Why are cylinders and displacement in a car correlated? What's the physical intuition behind it? Larger engine. Yeah, generally, People who have a lot of cylinders in the engine, V8 and so forth, they tend to be power hungry, like they want horsepower. So you can get horsepower by two means, by increasing the number of cylinders and the displacement of cylinders. They sort of go hand in hand. It would be silly to put a tiny cylinders and lots of them, but not go for displacement. So they usually go hand in hand. The other is, why is displacement and weight related? So strongly. Generally, when you have heavy cars or heavy vehicles, you you do you do need more powerful engines. One measure of power is uh, obviously uh, displacement, and so you can see that even cylinders would be correlated with uh, with weight, uh, sort of, isn't it? 0.89. That's fairly strong correlation. Displacement and horsepower. Why are they correlated? That's a no-brainer. Um, more displacement will cause more ignition or fuel ignition will therefore lead to more horsepower right? so um, let's look at the so the way by the way this problem is there in your ISLR so uh, I'm taking it through so that we are in effect solving a problem from the ISLR book from your textbook one thing is uh, you make a scatter plot of horsepower and mpg miles per gallon when you do that here is the scatter plot of miles per gallon what is the relationship? Does it look like a linear relationship, guys? Is this a linear relationship? Yeah, is there kind a of sloping, kind it's of a curved to the down to the right? So this kind of thing, and again, it goes back to what I say, uh, know your functions. If you know it, you will realize that this sort of behavior is, is unique to a very, it's a classic signature, not unique to it, but a classic signature of reciprocal functions. Y is proportional to one over X to the N, where N can be one, two, three. You can try it out, plot it out on your um, R or Python, you'll see that it plots like this, data plots like this. It begins to look like that. So how do you linearize it? If you are going to do linear regression, one of the questions is, can you convert this relationship to a linear function? So I would like to tell you a trick, which is very easy, but um, or perhaps not many people catch on to it. To linearize a reciprocal law, all you need to do is take the log of it. Because if I take the log of this, what does it become? Log y is proportional to minus n log x. It's, a, it's elementary mathematics, uh, nothing magical. You must have picked it up in your high school and perhaps forgotten it. Or it doesn't occur to you. When you see it, it becomes obvious. So now what happens? Log y as a new variable is linear in log, uh, log x, isn't it? So um, that is important. Uh, you have linearized the relationship. So let's move forward and say, let's build a regression model in just one variable. Can I predict miles per gallon using just horsepower? If you try to do that, this is your linear model, one line linear model. You can do it in Python. Again, the code will be very much the same as before in your previous labs. You realize that you get a fairly good model and your adjusted R square is 60%, 60, 61%, give or take. 
right? Uh, it's a pretty decent model. It's not bad. And if you visually inspect, a straight line relationship wouldn't be that bad. Uh, all the metrics look reasonably good. The T value looks healthy. The, right, the F statistics is good and so on and so forth. But when you plot the model over the data, you notice that it leaves something to be desired, isn't it? It's not the best model that you could have built. Right? And by the way, this, uh, the, all of this code is something that you're already familiar with by now. Hopefully, if you have been doing the previous labs, so you just uh, plot it out. What can we do? Is this the best relationship? You look at the residual plots, the residual stellar tail. When you look at this residual, uh, are you guys seeing this residuals versus fitted? Or uh, do you see a pattern in this residuals, guys? Yes. In fact, it, it seems to funnel out, isn't it? Here, the residuals are pretty close to each other, but as you move on the left-hand side, but as you move to the right, the residuals tend to spread out. What is the name of this particular pathology? Do you guys remember? I, I explained this to you guys. Heteroscedasticity. Yeah. It is heteroscedasticity, exactly. Okay. Right? Or what I call it is a cigar shape or, a, or sort of a funnel shape. Whenever you see that, generally, when you see funnel shape, this particular disease or this particular pattern in the residuals, here is a hint, guys. It generally means that don't deal with raw variables. Take a power transform of them. Remember the box cox thing that I mentioned? Take a power transform. And in fact, we talked about it. The power transform that seems to linearize the problem is taking a log transform, isn't it? Uh, zoom out. By taking a log transform, you can linearize the relationship, which was like this. And so data seems to uh, sort of suggest that, isn't it? We will, uh, where, where am I going? Yeah, we'll do that. So all of these have uh, leave something to be desired. Do you notice that the QQ plot also is sort of okay, but it sort of doesn't hug the axes very strongly. All of it indicates that a hypothesis, the relationship is okay, okay, it's not very good, right? Uh, do we find points of high leverage? Not particularly, or uh, but you're getting there. A couple of points seem to be exerting undue influence. Uh, there is a Cook's distance. There is a fence here. Uh, it's called the Cook's fence, uh, which you don't see in this diagram, which means that you don't have really points of high leverage. But if there were, you would see that. Right. And uh, let's let's see if we can do better. What what R square did we get? Uh, we got an R squared of 60%, 60.5. What happens if we instead model and in do a log transform, right? Uh, you take the log of miles per gallon and the log of horsepower, and then you build a model. It is something, actually, the ISLA book doesn't talk about these things, but these things come through a mostly practical experience in the, in the field. So I thought I'll share this with you. Just doing a simple log transform, do you notice that you model has gone to 72.2 percent r squared now in practical terms that's a huge jump right that is a 20 percent jump in your uh, in your model goodness right so that is uh, remarkable with just one line change in your code uh, just by thinking through and again goes to the fact that if you understand your math if you can think through the data uh, you can do uh, very well and right away you see, is, is this residual looking much better, guys? Would you say that you see almost no heteroscedasticity here? Isn't it? There's very little pattern yes. in the data. There is a little pattern, yeah. but your normal QQ plot begins to look much better. In general, it's become a much better model. So you do that, guys. Do think through your Get into wear a mathematician's hat always. Remember that data behind data is dynamics. And all of nature and all that happens around us, um, all systems are described by mathematics. So get into the mathematical mode. Now look at this. I'm projecting the hypothesis over the data. I've taken the log transform of the data and I'm projecting the hypothesis. Is the hypothesis or the model agreeing with the data? This is a far better agreement with the data than, for example, this model, isn't it? Look at this model here. 
data seems to be sloping down. This is a straight line. On the other hand, here, they, they are both in a much better agreement. And realize that we have just taken one feature, just one feature, horsepower, and we, have, we already seem to be at 72% accuracy. What happens if we take all the features? Let's build a model with all the features. So what I'm doing is origin is one, two, three. So we have to make it into factors. Factors means categorical variables as categorical. So when you do that, one easy way is that miles per gallon depends upon, you see this, the, the way to interpret this formula is you're saying miles per gallon, make a model where miles per gallon depends on everything, dot stands for everything, but remove origin and then add origin back as a factor. It means you have to convert it to a factor. You could have first converted it to factor and then you could have just said uh, miles per gallon depends on origin, but I was uh, being a bit uh, lazy. I, I suppose when you do this, you get this model. Now this model, if you look at it, first thing you notice is the adjusted R square is pretty good. It's 82%, all right? So it begins to feel that perhaps you're making progress, but then some things are alarming. Do you notice that the p-value of cylinders, is, uh, what is it? There are no stars here. This model seems to say that the number of cylinders don't matter for mileage. But it goes against practical experience, isn't it? Number of cylinders do matter. Displacement seems to matter. Weight seems to matter a lot. Goodness, acceleration doesn't seem to matter. Cylinders doesn't seem to matter. Uh, displacement sort of matters. What is going on? Horsepower doesn't seem to matter. How many of you feel that this flies in the face of common sense? Would you, would you yes. agree that if you really think about yeah. this model, absolutely doesn't make sense. So what do you think happened? So it is a little bit hard to uh, think what happens, but let me explain what happened. When there is a... Go ahead, Darius. Uh, it's because, um, you know, a cylinder's displacement, horsepower and weight correlate with each other. So. We cancel each other exactly. in the aggression. Exactly. So, uh, you know, there is a phrase in English called stole my thunder, you know, uh, to give you an example. Uh, let's say that you have just made some, uh, it, it's sort of a, I suppose in software world, it does happen. It's not pleasant. Uh, suppose you have been sitting in your office or your cubicle and you did something, your table, and you created something really nice and some colleague is passing by and you very excitedly explain it to him. And uh, then the colleague walks over to the powers that be, the bosses, and explains that this is the way to solve the problem, right? And uh, implicitly implying that uh, he did it. Uh, when uh, we all sometimes go through an experience like this, so that is he has stolen your thunder. Means uh, you were going to present it, get the uh, impact of it, but somebody has taken that away from you. And um, so Just that is no, you did not. It's very good. The the good thing is that I taught this, so you remembered it. I taught this in the last few lectures. Something called collinearity or multicollinearity. Remember, I taught about multicollinearity when multiple variables are highly correlated with each other, and therefore they can be written in terms of each other as equations in terms of each other. You have multicollinearity in the data. Multicollinearity, if you go back to the notes, you will see, screws up the modeling, screws up linear models. And uh, that's one of the weaknesses of linear models. When there are strong uh, multicollinearity, the model will uh, invariably end up picking one of the highly correlated features. Here, it seems to have gravitated to weight. It picked up weight, it gave a little bit of a value to displacement, and it basically stole, weight stole the thunder of horsepower and acceleration, isn't it? So now horsepower and acceleration seem to not matter, but and it's very misleading. What has really happened is that they're highly correlated with weight and displacement. And so those two variables stand, uh, these two are not there. And that is what you have to watch out when you do linear models. You have to watch out for strong correlations and uh, know how to deal with it. Well, let's say that you make this multilinear model, you plot it out, uh, 
you ask yourself is it better than the uh, single model it's so called the self yeah so like here like since the label like it says that like uh it's a cylinder di displacement like so we know that like if uh like if it was just said as like a variable one variable two variable three variable four can we still make the same determination that uh Actually, like example all you need to do here you look variable one two three the moment yeah. you see strong correlations you can immediately pick out and know that if i'm going to use linear regression i need to pick one of them or don't use linear regression use other regression methods that are robust in the presence of uh, correlations oh, okay that's how you would do it yeah so guys when you do this model once again the same problem happens you project this model on the data it's a linear model looks pretty pathetic you again have the heteroscedasticity <coughs> uh, where am i heteroscedasticity is still there you can see and uh, it's a good reasonably good qq plot we're getting somewhere uh, now what do you make out of it given the fact that it has heteroscedasticity you um, you say okay uh, we seem to make progress but look at this uh, something is wrong with the model can we build a better model uh, then the other thing you can do and this is because the the way the problem in the book was posed the next thing you can do is you can add interaction terms when you add interaction terms your model gets even better you get to 85% correlation when you get it. and you can literally see that you know uh, these are the interaction terms the product terms that have come in and this is by the way the uh, r language means of adding interaction terms uh, in uh, python it's a little bit harder you have to do it by hand but uh, r is a bit more elegant in that space the same thing in python at least as of this moment is many more lines of code uh, using scikit learn in the uh, stats model because you can directly plug in the r formula it will still be the same expression which is why stats model has getting has been getting quite a lot of attention in the in 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 communities that mostly rely on linear regression methods linear and logistic methods so um so there we go the, the star means consider displacement consider cylinder and consider also their product all three possibilities when you add interaction terms your model improves you notice right again its cylinders don't seem to matter which is worrying and uh, you, it's hard to believe this model you say well, what is going on the model works but um, it's, it's a bit misleading can we build a model that is not misleading and again this is a 3d visualization of the hypothesis surface that it builds i have put two two axes weight and horsepower and this is miles per gallon because here weight and horsepower seem to matter uh, i put mileage as you can see it's a non linear uh, sort of a relationship do you see that guys and that non linearity is brought in because of the interaction terms so now at the end of it what can you do the thing is now i invite you to experiment with this data and uh, make the best possible model that you can so this goes beyond what the book asked you to in the exercise to do but go beyond that and ask yourself what is the best model i can do the reason i'm mentioning it is that data science is all about persistence you build a model you build a better model and you build a better model and you don't give up you keep on trying to build a better and better and better model so one of the things that this model is missing is a log transform we already saw the value of the log transform what if we brought that idea of log transform into the data so now we are going beyond what your book could imply so i'm building a model now in the log transform of the data and i'm just taking a three three variables weight horsepower and year you notice that i'm not taking all the variables i'm just taking weight horsepower and year i could have taken something else huh? weight i could have taken a weight display cylinder year or weight it doesn't matter they all highly correlated if i build a model in that you realize that you do you not what do you think about this model now so let's see uh, what we think about this bit of code let's focus on this do do the t values look good they all look reasonably robust p values look good they are three stars and uh, 
What about the R squared? This has jumped up to surprisingly close to 89%, 88.5%. This is obviously beating all the previous models, and we are doing with only three variables, and we got away with it. Now, here's a bit of homework exercise for you. You can very easily beat this model by slightly different variables. I leave that as an exercise for you. Right? And that will be fun for you to come up with a model that beats even this. Do that and have fun with it as you do the homework. So you can beat this model. But now I'll just stop at this model and you ask, is this, let's look at the residual plot of it. And this model therefore reflects this relationship, you know, the, the mathematical equation that you ultimately come up with is this. Uh, let me zoom out. Yeah, a uh, little bit more zooming out. Yeah, look at this log mpg so this is the equation that you write to describe the relationship between the variables does it work it is this equation seven point this is the intercept this is the how much the weight matters how much the horsepower matters clearly the weight matters a lot more than the horsepower and both of them contribute negatively to the mileage which again makes sense but year contributes positively to the mileage which also seems to make sense so it looks like a sensible model if you look at these statistics or these diagnostic numbers they all look healthy so now let's look at the residual plot when you look at the residual plot you realize that uh, do you see that heteroscedasticity here or do you see any significant pattern in the residuals here You don't see much. Mm, just so, a little bumpy. Just a little bumpy, but more or less you don't see any pattern there. So it's getting much better. Your normal QQ plots are getting better. And therefore, you, you at this moment I stopped here, but uh, with the caveat that I know you can do better. With very easy, that's, I leave it as a homework. Do this lab and then try to improve upon this model. My a hint to you is you can easily beat this model. The other data set that we talk about is the famous car seats data set. This is exercise 10 in your textbook. This data set is about, let's go and explore this data set. Again, do the exploratory analysis of this data set. But these are the factors. The target variable is how much car seats will you sell based on a whole set of factors. Now this one I'll go through much faster. So you can summarize the data, you can see what matters. When you do the pair plots, again, don't use the basic pairs, which I used here, because this is in the interest of speed. I wanted to focus on the main machine learning part, but do it the way I taught you in the exploratory data analysis. Do it with elegance and detail. So do that and make your pairwise plots and so on and so forth. Make your uh, correlation plots and everything. Right? You do the missing value analysis, do all of that. Uh, I have sort of just hinted at it and moved forward. So you build a model, sale of ice cream depends, um, sale of not ice cream, sorry, car seats, depends on the price of a car seat seems to make sense, or whether you're selling in an urban or rural area and whether it is US or not. Right? So for example, car seats would be rather, would not have much of a sale in India because uh, it's not the law to have car seats. And so a lot of people uh, don't use car seats for their children in India. Though I would argue the laws of physics are exactly the same and people should be using. But in US, it's, it's the law to use car seats for children. And so you would expect more car seats sell in the US. Let's see if that holds out. Ah, when you build a model like that, you realize that price, of course, it is price sensitive in the negative direction. You make your product more expensive, you'll sell less. US matters. Right. If you are in the US, you're likely to sell more car seats. Surprisingly, whether you're selling to urban or rural areas doesn't seem to matter. Or maybe not surprisingly, because parents are parents. Uh, people in urban areas and rural areas equally care for their children. And it being the law, of course, uh, we all buy car seats. So urban does not matter, seem to matter. What is the R square we're getting? 23%. Would you call that a good model or bad model, guys? Would you be satisfied with this model? No. Any comments, guys? Right? Yeah, you would. No. Yeah. Now, here's it. And this is the reason I brought this up. Because um, goodness depends on which field you are. In, in the hard sciences, like particle physics, etc., for physicists, 
a good R square would be like 99.999 or something like that, some ridiculously high value before they believe things. They would, they would be very finicky and grumpy at anything below 90%. Um, in other fields, data is not so clean. Uh, for example, uh, medical data generally tends to be squishy. You know, a lot of, like, first of all, you don't get big data sets and it's very hard to gather data. You have to do meta studies on studies and so forth. And the other thing is data always comes with noise and unknown factors. Human body is very hard to quantify exactly. So data tends to be soft and you won't get R squared in the 90s there usually. But then you go to, um, uh, psychological or social data, social sciences data, data gets even more squishy. Your R squares generally tend to be much lower. By the time you go to things like advertising and marketing and sales, the models are actually too many factors at play and usually very simple models don't quite work. Right? So actually, as you will see, the next page to your surprise, even with low R square, do you notice that the residuals that residual analysis is pretty healthy. As you go from left to left to right, the, there is no significant uh, widening of the residuals. Right, normal. Excuse me. Normal QQ plot looks normal, quite healthy, which is surprising. And the lesson here is that R square is not a measure of a good model. Sometimes that is the best you can do. You can simplify your model by throwing away urban and aspects. So you have just price in US, you get a pretty healthy model and you, you get satisfied that 23 and a half percent R squared is as good as it gets because the rest of the model diagnostics is pretty healthy. Are we together? And so it's a lesson to learn in that, that you have to live with it. The next exercise in your book, and I would suggest you do this, is exercise 14, which talks about collinearity of data. You artificially create data. You create some random numbers, which you call x1. Then you create x2 by taking half of x1, and then you add some noise to it, a normal noise, you know, Gaussian noise to it. And then you write an equation, which is y is equal to 2 plus, you know, make, made out of this. When you create this data, you will end up with a data set x1, x2, x3 and y, with the understanding that y is the target variable, x1 and x2 are highly correlated, isn't it? So this is to illustrate collinearity, what it does to the data. So this is x1, x2 correlation. You can see a strong correlation. x1 and y are not that strongly correlated. So when you build a regression model, you get a model like this. You get an adjusted R square of 19%, that's okay. You get only X1 seems to barely matter, X, X2 doesn't seem to matter. Now what is more peculiar is that if you just change the data a little bit, just add a point or two and your model will completely change. In other words, it has a lot of instability. You, you just change the model a little bit uh, here. Uh, so here's the model with just X1, just with X2. Uh, individual, just with X1, X2 are pretty good. But the moment you uh, stay with the original model and you change it a little bit, go back and add just one more point to the model, suddenly X1 doesn't matter, X2 begins to matter. So this exercise is just to illustrate the pathology of multicollinearity in the data. When a data is highly correlated, here we literally created synthetic data which is highly correlated, then you will be, your model will get hijacked with multicollinearity. Right? Linear models don't behave very well in the presence of multicollinearity. That is the one lesson to learn. Right? And so uh, I'll stop there. Then there is the Boston data set. Once again, really worth doing. It's about crime. The crime in Boston depends on what. Obviously, there's a pair plot. Now, by now, it should all begin to look very familiar to you. This is the correlation table. You build a model. You see, as you can see, just because you got a lot of factors in your data doesn't mean they really matter. They may or may not matter, or at least from a linear regression perspective, they may or may not matter. So I won't go too much into it. This is all about taking some log transforms and trying and doing better. But at the end of it, a naive model has a 43%, a 44% R squared. Right? And you can see that there are a lot of uh, 
factors that don't seem to matter. You can play around with it. At the end of it, you can see what works for you. I played around with it, and then I stopped at this model. When I stopped at this model in which I have log transform, polynomials, the two tricks that I taught you, both of them put here. Why did I take the log transform? By looking at the you know, correlation and seeing the sloping, the sl sloping behavior, curvy behavior, I put a log there. And at the end of it, you suddenly go to 87%, almost double the R squared. And this model certainly seems much more healthy if you look at it. And that is the beauty of it. Uh, you can build much better models just through experimentation and using the tricks up your sleeve. So don't give up. The, the, what we have learned is when you do a multilinear regression, you don't give up. You uh, keep on trying to improve the method. So I'll summarize what we learned. We learned multilinear regression. We learned a little bit about signal and noise variables. Some variables don't matter. They just add noise to it, and you have to remove it. Removing them helps. Next lesson we learned, observe the degree of correlation between the regressors, between the inputs or the features. See what it is. Identify outliers. That's important. See in the, you see that in the residual plots and so forth. Identify points of high leverage in the data. Check for interaction terms and their effects. Be aware of the phenomenon of collinearity. And how such unstable models can be disproportionately affected by points of uh, high leverage. And so these are the lessons. These are some of the things we learned. Right? So this is what we learned. Linear regression is often called the ordinary least square regression. The name implies that uh, maybe there are things beyond that. And in fact, uh, ML200 is all about very, very powerful regression methods that go beyond the foundations. This is foundational. Make sure you learn all of it because you won't understand the very powerful methods we'll do in ML200 unless you have done this lab and understood these things. Are we together, guys? Still, they're very effective. Linear regression, the beauty is simple, it's interpretable, and so forth. So guys, uh, that is it. We can take a break. We have two choices. We can end today right here, or we can take a break for, let's say, 20 minutes or so, and then come back and then do the classifier lab. Which way are you leaning, guys? Yeah, we can take a break and come back. Okay. Yeah. Take a break of about uh, 11, approximately 11.20. Let's come back at 11.45. And we'll do the next slide. Oh, you mean like 145? 120. Yeah, yeah, one, one, yeah, it is 120 now, and let's meet at 145. Okay. So we'll see, see you guys then. Yeah, Asif, I have a question. Asif, you can pause the recording. Okay, let me pause the recording. Let's see. We are on record, guys, now. Are you folks able to see my screen? Anyone could give me a feedback if you are seeing my screen? Yeah. You are. OK. So we will talk about classifiers now. Now, remember, the classifiers are a predictive model. So its target variable is a categorical. It's a class out of a category of classes. So uh, it could be a cow or a duck. It could be uh, things like that, you know, uh, whether uh, to give a loan or not to give a loan to a person, you know, uh, whether the person is likely to default if you gave him a loan or not, and so many things, whether the person is sick or not, or, uh, or maybe whether the, if you look at diabetes, a person is completely healthy, pre-diabetic, or with diabetes, and things like that, multi-class classification. So that is the context for uh, today's lab now. Now, classifiers are... Uh, Obviously, the dominant part of machine learning, uh, most, like a majority, 60 to 70 percent of the data set presents, uh, present themselves as classification problem. So obviously, there's a vast literature on classifiers. Today, obviously, we will cover the three classifiers we learned in the theory class, logistic regression, linear discriminant analysis, and quadratic discriminant analysis. To do that, we will take... Uh, well, this is some background work. I've done it in R and in Python also, I believe. Uh, 
we will explore data set it's called classifier one so as always we load the data we split that now here we are going to split the data into test and training set it is important now i've started doing that what it means is you should always split the data so that you know that you have overfit if your performance on the training data exceeds the performance on the testing data by a wide margin. So that's how you come to know. We discussed this in the theory part. So here it is, the descriptive statistics. The inputs are X and Y, both are numerical, and T is the target variable, is zero or one. It is, oh, sorry, no, here it is one and two. Uh, levels are zero, one, or uh, yeah, one, two, I don't know. Uh, is, what is it, yeah. Zero, one. So let's look at this data here. First thing we want to do is plot the data. So here is the plot of the data, basic plot. Clearly, you can see a decision boundary. I hope you can just discern a decision boundary going diagonally through it, off diagonally through it. The red dots and the black dots, there's a region of overlap between them. So right off the bat, we know that we are not going to get a perfect classifier. There will be some error rates because they are overlap regions. Fortunately, the X and Y are not, they're mutually independent. They are not cross correlated. So we don't have to worry about correlation between the predictors. This is a histogram of their relationships just to see the X versus X frequency, Y frequency, and so on and so forth for the two different colors, T is equal to zero and T is equal to one. Right? The binary classifier. We have sufficient number of data. For linear models, there is a rule of thumb that I keep telling you is that there should be at least 20 times the number of predictors. Here there are two predictors, so it means that you should have uh, at least 40 data sets. Fortunately, we have actually close to 1500 data sets, which is huge. No correlation between the predictors. So the, now let's build a logistic regression model. The method is very simple. It's very much like linear regression. The only thing is that there's a G in front of it. Generalized linear model. Instead of LM, we write GLM. Formula remains the same. A generalized linear model. There are many, many what I call link functions. You guys, please mute yourself. Is that moved over now? Yeah. Awesome. I did my mouth. I'm going to plug back in. Right. Can you please mute yourself? Intro machine. Yeah. All right, guys. So, um, getting back to our thing, we have to give, and this is generalized linear model says, uh, you can use a lot of uh, functions giving the relationship between input and output, uh, the input vector, you know, the x dot beta, and the output. And here it is the binomial or the logistic function. Logistic function is also called the binomial function. So we use the binomial method. It's historic. Just put it there. This would be the way you would do it. The formula, T depends on this. The only extra thing is you put the binomial word there and uh, the G here. Other than that, things remain the same. It's a simpler thing. The null deviance is the deviance, think of it as sort of the residual. It's different, but in a very, very close, approximate sense, you can think of it as, a, as like the residual, the equivalent of residuals. Now, the, if, if for the null hypothesis, the deviance is, oh, sorry, the deviance is 2057, and the residual deviance of your model is this. The point is that if there is a significant reduction of null deviance, you feel that you have built a good model. Now, some people use the term pseudo R squared. What they do is they treat this as a, <coughs> a TSS, total sum squared error. And they look at this as RSS, the residual sum squared error, and they compute the R squared, this minus this over total. Right? So um, in that case, uh, you get something called a pseudo R squared. I tend not to like the wording because uh, it's a misnomer. It's not really the same thing. But uh, quite a few books actually talk about the pseudo R squared. So I'm just letting you know that people use those terms. I don't. So you build a model like that, and let's see what does it come to. You're trying to build a decision boundary. 
intercept is this and uh, intercept of x the intercept coefficient beta naught is this this is beta one this is beta two right so here we go three values let's look at the model diagnostics in classification if you remember we look at the confusion matrix so but when you classify logistic regression you predict what is the prediction that it is a black point so you need to choose a cutoff Right here, the cutoff for no other reason. Uh, in the absence of any information, you take a cutoff of 0 0.5. You're saying if it is greater than 0 0.5, mark it as one, otherwise zero. Right. Likewise for prediction, a test prediction, test training, test prediction. Apply the model to both, create the confusion matrix, and look at the accuracy of the training and the or testing data, both of them. So first we do it for training data. This is a confusion matrix. Clearly, the principal diagonal is pretty good. We have made 50 plus 58, that is 108 mistakes out of 1500. A pretty healthy, one would say, training data accuracy is 92.8%. Error rate is about 7%, so reasonably healthy. And uh, then, so that's that. If you look at, uh, so there is a library called Carrot, Carrot which sort of makes things a little bit uh, fancier. If you if you give, if you call the confusion matrix method on the, using caret, what it will do is it will take your confusion matrix, that is uh, this, and it will predict a lot of uh, statistics like sensitivity, specificity, a positive, uh, a positive prediction value, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it will give you a lot more met metric if you're presenting your data to clients, etc. It may be useful to show all of these metrics. Right? Uh, Carrot is obviously influenced by the older statistical generation. You can see the use of their terminology, but very commonly used. The, the person who created Carrot has written this wonderful book, Predictive uh, Modeling. Um, and I invite you to read that. It has a lot of practical advice on how to analyze the data. And quite a few people use Carrot still. I prefer using, not using it, I use other libraries but for what it is worth. It's a good library. But I do use their confusion matrix function. It was well done. Now, on the test data, when you look at the accuracy, it's 93.66. What was the accuracy there? It was 92.8. So you notice that the test accuracy is pretty close to um, training accuracy. In fact, it's more than the training accuracy, which is a small accident of the data, but it's good. It means that uh, we have a model that doesn't have overfitting. Uh, this code is exactly the same at the top. Right? It's a pretty good model, and we can see whether that uh, the decision boundary when we plot it on the data agrees or not. But before that, we also need to draw the ROC curve. Remember, I talked about the ROC curve. So when you look at the ROC curve, it seems to remember I said that the, the further away it is from the diagonal, the better. Clearly, this ROC curve is quite far from the diagonal. It's practically hugging the top left hand side. And the area under ROC curve is 98.4%, which is excellent. Right? This gives you the sense that you have a pretty good model. One of the things you worry about is you took the cutoff at 0 0.5. Was it a good idea to do that? Could you have taken a different cutoff? Right? And so you can do a plot of the cutoff versus accuracy. How much accuracy would change as you slide the cutoff value from 50% uh, up and so forth and you realize that at the top there is a plateau there's a at the top of the hill there's a plateau which means that it's not very sensitive to the choice of cutoff uh, pretty good values you get for anywhere in this top plateau of course don't go to the extremes and finally just as a linear regression we plot the model predictions of the model over the data and when we do that we see this decision boundary so would you guys feel that this decision boundary is accurate? Anybody? Do you like this decision boundary? Yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, so that's that. So it's a good analysis. Now in this, you have to be aware, all of this code, you'll, you'll have to become a bit familiar. There's nothing magical to it, just one line code. Model, one line makes the model. Then you have to do use the model to make predictions. Create the confusion matrix, show the confusion matrix, but then find the area under ROC curve, and then plot the model over data, exactly what we did for regression. So this is it.
How do we deal with Python? Python is no different, it's very similar. Here we go with Python. You take the data, you again summarize the data, visualize the data, split the data into training and test. And then what do we do? We build a model, a logistic regression model. You see that logistic regression model. Solver is Newton NG. You don't have to give it. Uh, not giving it would be just by default is good enough. But then you make predictions. You create the confusion matrix. You get the same confusion matrix. You get a you get precision and recall. People these days tend to um, use those words more often. Precision and recall are ninety three percent. Both very good. The harmonic mean of precision and recall, which is the F one score, is this. Right. It's, it's, it's pretty good. What is the accuracy that came out to be? Somewhere we must have plotted the accuracy also. Oh, I didn't mention the accuracy. But we can compute it from the confusion matrix. And uh, these are the model values. You try to plot this model on the data. And by the way, this is plotting code. Uh, it's a bit of a boilerplate code. We tend to use the same code again and again. Uh, but uh, I thought I'll give it because a lot of people have asked me, can you show how I make this decision boundaries and how I show the probabilities? So I've given the code in its entirety. Yeah. And obviously, I'll post the Jupyter Notebook so you can have it. It's a bit colorful. It can literally see say that at the bottom, you're pretty sure it's blue, uh, one type of data. As you go closer and closer to the decision boundary, you're not so sure. The probability becomes half. And finally, the probability becomes... Uh, red, right? it goes to the other region. So you can see the decision boundary here. For both of it, I've given the code of drawing it. Uh, area under ROC curve, exactly the same thing. You can see the same value, 98, hopefully. Yeah, 98.4% area under ROC curve, which is very healthy. So this is using the, using the Skikit Learn library. Skikit Learn is, of course, a favorite library for uh, statistical, I mean, for machine learning outside the deep neural networks region. Uh, we move on to linear discriminant analysis, LDA. Uh, go, if you remember, LDA looks for hilltops and does a perpendicular bisector of them. If you solve the same problem with LDA, code is just one liner as always. LDA, this, and you can ask LDA to plot type both. It will do that. You can create the models and so on and so forth. Uh, it takes a while to uh, see. I mean, it, it just reproduces the same results. The, uh, the confusion matrix is that the accuracy is 93%, pretty much the same. 93, uh, training error is about 7%, 6.8, more or less the same. Uh, there is no material difference between using logistic regression and uh, linear discriminant analysis. You get essentially the same result. All of this code of uh, model validation are exactly the same. The only difference is the one line. You use the LDA function to build a LDA model. That's it. One line change. Other things remain the same. Area under the ROC curve, again, is 98%. <coughs> Very good. Here I've divided the decision, the regions into the red and the black. So you see that. Um, how a decision boundary splits the region into two halves. The same thing we can do using, uh, well, this was with R, and the Python code is exactly the same. All you do is you change it with linear discriminant analysis and fit. It is the same as the logistic regression code. You just make one line change. When you do that, again, you'll get pretty good results. If you do quadratic discriminant analysis, things don't quite get better. They are more or less the same because here decision boundary was linear. So trying out a more sophisticated model is not going to give you uh, anything more. Right? So this is it. The Python version is again one line change. Replace the word linear discriminant analysis with uh, quadratic discriminant analysis. But if you look at this picture here, you can see that when you use quadratic discriminant analysis, think of the white thing here, the decision boundary. Do you notice that it is not straight, it is curved? If you look very carefully, you can see a very gentle curve of the line of the decision boundary. That is the nature of the quadratic discriminant analysis. right? And so that is that. Let's look at another data set, a data set like this. This data set has four classes, you know, there's blue, green, uh, maroon, and black. Four types of data are there, four classes are there, sorry. And then we have to 
to find a classifier for that. So obviously it's multi-class classification. Logistic regression is not appropriate. You can use it, but it's uh, better to try LDA. When you try LDA, it works quite well, actually. Um, the model diagnostic, the accuracy is 95.6%. Look at this, the code remains the same, guys. No, no change in code from the previous one, except that you have changed the data set. If you draw the decision boundaries, would you guys feel that these decision boundaries are pretty reflective of reality? Yes. Pretty accurate, right? And so you have an accurate model. You have a high accuracy, specificity, uh, sensitivity, all of that. And likewise, you can use QDA. Again, you'll get 96.7. I don't think the numbers changed. 95.9 became 96.6. Very slight increase in accuracy, not much more. But the decision boundaries when you use quadratic, do you see that they are all curved? The decision boundaries look entirely different. A QDA has interpreted the data very differently from LDA. So it's something to know that models may have the same predictions, but the way under underneath it, the hypothesis they build uh, may be different. You see how the red points are all within an oval kind structure, isn't it? And this is different from the linear decision boundary of the LDA. If you go back and look at the LDA, you notice that these are all very linear decision boundaries. Okay? All of them seem to have gotten equal regions, or more or less equal regions, whereas here, red is confined to a limited space. It gives you the same accuracy. Now let's look at data set three. When you look at data set three, guys, are you following me? There's a lot of very quiet people. I hope- um, Asif, I have a question actually. So um, ah, go ahead. I read somewhere that the, the difference between logistic regression and uh, the linear discriminant analysis, like one of the aspects is if we deal with uh, multi-class classifiers, uh, LDA is better than logistic regression. Could you um, justify it? In... Because it is native to it. Whereas when you use a uh, logistic, you are doing one versus the rest. Right? Remember the one versus the rest that I taught you in logistic. Yeah. Okay. So you're doing, you're building. First of all, you're building a lot of models internally. Right. So that is inefficient. And secondly, generally, see, at the end of it, there are no clear answers. But generally, multi-class classification, you can do with logistic, but uh, it gets a little bit harder. LDA, QDA, discriminant analysis is very natural to do that. So if you can, uh, you should certainly try discriminant analysis first. Okay. Now, for example, this data set, I can make it work, believe it or not. I can make it work with a logistic regression. It will be messier. You'll have to build more models, three, four models, right? One versus rest kind of a thing, four models. So a little bit messier, more computationally intensive and so forth. Computational intensity doesn't matter these days, but still not as clean, right? Okay. Look at data set three, guys. This, this egg shaped in the center is the yolk and outside are the dots. Uh, what do you think we can do? Uh, this is a binary classification, isn't it? Maroon and maroon and gray. Uh, can we use logistic regression, guys? What do you think? It's not very linear. Uh, no. So even though it's binary classification, you cannot naively use logistic regression. The way to use logistic regression would be to use logistic regression with polynomial terms. And I leave that as an exercise for you to verify that if you use logistic regression with polynomial terms, then it will work. But a naive logistic regression, a direct application logistic regression will fail simply because you just visual inspection shows that the decision boundary is uh, elliptical shape. It is not at all a straight line. Right? So you need something to capture an ellipse. And if you remember your algebra from high school, you'll remember that ellipse are quadratic equations. So at the very minimum, you would need a quadratic term, your logistic regression, and then it will work. Okay? I'll leave that as an exercise for you. You can try the one hour rule. I mean, sorry, another one. You can try the LDA and QDA, and you'll get an impressive 99.5% accuracy if you try that. 
So that is something to know. I won't, I won't give the code because code is redundant. It's exactly the same code. Just substitute class, class, uh, name of this data set, load this data set with the same code. So this kind of a AU ROC is certainly very impressive. Right, 92 accuracy. Now, one of the questions is, could we have used logistic regression? I asked, yes, you could have actually. As I said, you can add polynomial terms with interaction because you have x squared terms, y squared terms, and xy terms, if you remember the equation of an ellipse. And when you do that, once again, your accuracy will be pretty impressive. Uh, 90, you see the accuracy here, 95.8. It seems to be even better than um, the LDA and QDA. And this may surprise people. Quite often people say that you can't use logistic regression uh, because there's no linearity. The, the statement needs to be modified by saying you can't use logistic regression directly if there's non-linearity. But you can accommodate non-linearity by going to polynomial terms and interaction terms, as I did here. Yeah, actually, this is one of the questions I ask in interviews to data scientists. Uh, what you're looking at is I say, can you solve this, uh, this data problem using just logistic regression? And usually the answer I get is you can't do it. Clearly, you can't do it because it's that. But actually, you can. And I'm, I'm still waiting for a candidate who will uh, say that, yes, you can do it using higher order terms. So that is that for uh, classification, guys. Huh? So these are three data sets. I want you guys to warm up to it. Next time, I will do deal with a real life data set, a couple of real life data sets. One is. Uh, Asif, can you repeat that again? Uh, just one more time. Look at this solution. I have used, I have actually used this logistic regression, right? But I have gone to a different space, a more expanded space with quadratic terms in it. When I go to the space, I can actually make the logistic regression work best. Do you see how it is? By attaching polynomial terms to the logistic regression, I suddenly have a very successful model. With the, the area under ROC curve of this is 99.46. It's close to perfection, isn't it? Yeah, impressive. Yes, so the lesson that I'm trying to emphasize is do not believe in cliches that people tell you, think. This field is all about thinking, not so much about coding. And uh, you can use very elementary code and come up with brilliant analysis of the data. And uh, just through thinking and think, uh, thinking carefully through the data and how you can use your tools. I mean, I suppose I'll end this with a, a sort of story that I like to tell and humor me for telling that. See, when you get into photography, so I'm into photography, as some of you know, I don't quite get as much time to pursue it rigorously, but I do do photography. So in photography, in Silicon Valley, at least here in the Bay Area, you can always tell an engineer who has just made a lot. He'll be holding a very expensive digital SLR camera, right, and roaming around everywhere. And you can, and if you look carefully at his camera, uh, it is set on automatic. Uh, as photographers know that in automatic mode, most likely his pictures are no better than an iPhone. In fact, probably worse even with that fancy equipment, right? So then after a little while, you know, he tries many, many things, uh, gradually maybe learns to venture out of the automatic mode, but then he figures out that, okay, to take good pictures, you need a good lens, right? So he goes and splurge, splurges on very big lens. You can see those people in the beach. If you ever go to the beaches here, in the middle of the day, they would be carrying a camera with a long lens and they will be a nuisance to their uh, spouse or kids because they'll be asking their spouse and kids and family to pose and uh, people would be just tired of them. I don't know if you guys have seen it. They'll be standing far and using a big telephoto lens. It's a, it's a fairly common sight if you are on the beaches. You know, photographers know that actually you can immediately spot these people because no photographer would take pictures in the middle of the day. Can you tell why on a beach? Could somebody tell me why? Anybody with photography experience? Over exposure. Sure. Yeah. Is it the light? Light is not. 
conducive for taking like fiction like during the midnight like the uh, not midnight but the in the afternoon or and, uh, i think it's also the waves right like gives you a lot of different lights from different angles that's you, right you, you need empty filter sir uh, that you can do with neutral density filter but true see in daytime what happens is sun is shining overhead when sun is shining overhead it casts shadows on your face so if you look at any pictures taken on the beach during the day you'll see shadows under your eyes and so forth uh, those pictures are not nice to not i mean they're good as snapshots as memory uh, but uh, certainly uh, and as snapshots they're wonderful as memory they are so serve a very useful purpose but they are not works of photography as such as art uh, during the evening light comes at an angle at your face it's a softer light and you get much better pictures and paradoxically when it is foggy or cloudy again the light is diffuse you don't have strong shadows once again you take very good pictures in foggy or a cloudy weather then those are the times so good photographers will come out and take pictures let's say on the beach if it is cloudy foggy or if it is uh, very early morning or late evening nature photographers only take pictures during very early morning and late evenings they rarely take pictures during the day this they probably sleep and rest uh, if they are on a shooting uh, shooting thing so the point is that that's how people behave and so the joke is that uh, these novices you know they realize that camera didn't do it lenses don't didn't do it what must it be and finally it dawns on them that probably what they need is a big tripod and then they ask the okay. biggest tripod their wife is willing to carry <laughs> big heavy tripod and so sort of a joke but if you look at great photographers the ones who do the national geographic and things like that they don't use point and shoot they use a dslr uh, but their dslr may not be the latest and greatest they just have a good professional dslr uh, maybe 2 3 years old and they will have a simple lens one or two lenses at most and they can go into any culture or any forest or any place and a few weeks later they can come back with absolutely per, you know beautiful pictures that make their way into the national geographic so those national geographic and those great uh, magazines that have those wonderful pictures they actually taken by photographers who don't carry too much equipment quite often and that is the point i'm trying to make the long story short in machine learning there are a lot of fancy tools and they act as the shiny ball people get very much they they caught up in the glitter of the tools it is not about the tools you can use very simple tools it is about the craftsmanship you know like the photographer who can walk into any place with good enough equipment professional equipment but not nothing fancy and not too much but can come out of that with absolute zingers be like that guys look at data think about data most great analysis can be done Uh, without the shiny ball syndrome use the tools when you have to there are situations to use very fancy tools but there are quite a few situations where you can you could have gotten much better results with simpler tools and a lot of thinking and that works better because you have very interpretable models models that you can explain to business to to the layman and so forth anyway with those words i'm done with classifiers any questions guys right now all right guys so we have done regression and classification our last topic for this workshop is clustering we will do clustering in the last two lectures i hope guys see one thing i'm not able to enforce during the uh, video lectures of course and this remote sessions is doing the lab in the class if you were there and the premise of course i would not have let you go home till you had finished the labs and i can't do that and so it is purely voluntary whether you're doing the labs or not catch up on the labs guys i know that most people to various degrees have been um, you know falling a little bit behind it's is a natural but do catch up uh, let's not go into ml 200 till you have caught up with the labs and done all the labs and reach out for help as you need to do uh, asif uh, can you explain like the what's a student t distribution Uh, let's keep it for the math. Uh, I'll, I'll explain it to you maybe on one on one. Uh, it's a distribution okay. that sort of looks like a bell curve, uh, but uh, but is different. Uh, it's flatter. 
in some sense. Uh, let's talk about it later because it needs a lot of explaining in the background. Oh, okay. Yeah, because in one of the exercises it was mentioned, like so when I was doing it, like so it talked about like the student T distribution. Ah, oh, that is for the confidence interval and so forth. Yes, yes, yeah. At this moment, just use it because in engineering, cover the distribution in great detail. So let's keep it for that. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll stop the recording, guys. Eh?